Hey, picked up really quick. Um, I just finally finished all my Christmas decorations and I was wondering if you wanted to come over and enjoy them with me, maybe have a cup of tea, do some Bible study if you want to. Okay, great. Yeah, you can come over right now. Okay, awesome. I'll go ahead and get some water boiling and set the table and make sure you're careful driving here, okay? Alright, I'll see you soon. Okay, bye-bye. Take a seat right here. I set the table all nice and pretty. I'm just really happy that you could come. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a while. I really wanted to spend some time with you, catch up. Yeah. How have you been doing? bags.
kettle really quick. especially in the morning right as I'm reading the Bible it's kind of my routine I make a cup of tea and I read one to three chapters but I figured it'd be a good time to do a Bible study with you and maybe talk about some prophecy before we get into that before I forget I do have something for you. I have two things, actually. I have these sheet masks for your face. Because who doesn't love a facial mask from time to time? And I also got you this coffee mug candle. store and I figured why not buy it and use it it's probably been sitting on the shelf for like years let's see how this tastes it smells so nice
thanks so much for helping me to clear off the table. Let's do a little bit of spa time. So, we have three options here. be reading a lot of Old Testament scriptures, um, but I'm going to start off actually with one passage from the New Testament, kind of opening up with the words of Jesus himself, and we are going to go to John chapter 5, starting at verse 37. is that Jesus is in the middle of a conversation with the Pharisees and we're going to see that he is very very straightforward with them but we're going to learn something here let me open up quickly with a word of prayer okay and we'll jump right into it dear Lord Thank you 
for this time. I pray that you would bless these moments as I open up the scriptures with my friend. May you give us both eyes to see and ears to hear how your word, your Old Testament, speaks of the coming one that is fulfilled in Jesus. May you help us, Lord, to be filled with awe and wonder at how powerful and amazing your word is. And I just ask for help for teaching and for delivering your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, John chapter 5, starting at verse 37. And I do have some highlighters here if you ever want to highlight borrow one of mine. Okay. It's good to see you have your Bible ready. <sighs> and the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures, because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. We're going to jump down to verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Right there. We see that Jesus believed that the Old Testament was about him. I think as we look more into these Old Testament scriptures, we're going to see exactly what Jesus was talking about here. And this is such a huge body of prophecy. I'm only going to be going over just a few. And um, it just, you'll begin to see how they all converge on this one person. And it's even more amazing because Bible is written over this big expanse of time of thousands of years and it has different literary genres it's written by different authors from different countries and um, it's just amazing that you still see a continuous narrative throughout all this time and you continue to see these expectations and hopes that pop up scriptures. So we're going to go all the way back to Genesis, to the first prophecy. It's often called the Proto-Evangelion, which means the first gospel. Genesis 3.15. This is right after Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit of the tree and were deceived. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The idea here is that there is this coming descendant of Eve who will destroy the serpent who brought in all these things of terror and horror It's very broad. All we know about this promise is that it's a man because it says he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The offspring is a man, but we don't really know much else. So you keep reading through Genesis. Genesis 1 through 11 is mostly big picture stuff. Um, Proto-history. <laughs> and then you get to Genesis 12, which is the 
calling of Abraham and we were introduced to Israel it's the start of it and we see this promise this next promise that all the nations will be blessed through Abraham's offspring we see this in Genesis 12 verses 2 through 3 but I'm actually going to go a little bit further to Genesis 22 verse 15, okay? Genesis 22 verse 15 all the way to verse 18 And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord because you have done this and have not withheld your son your only son I will surely bless you I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed This oath concentrates on a single descendant of Abraham who will overcome his enemies and bring blessing to all the nations of the earth. That's what my commentary says. This oath to Abraham comes to fulfillment in Jesus Christ and it references Acts verse 3 or chapter 3 and Galatians chapter 3 verse 16. My point is, right at the beginning of the Bible, we have this sense of hope and expectation, but it's still very broad. But you keep reading, and then you get to Genesis 49, and this is right after the story of Joseph and the famine in Egypt, and after he is brought back to his dad. Joseph, uh, Jacob and Jacob is blessing his 12 sons which later become the 12 tribes of Israel so let's go to Genesis 49 
promised by God. And this is typically referred to as the Davidic covenant. This kingdom will last forever. So, after King David is his son Solomon. And this is a really high point for Israel. Lots of wealth and riches. But after Solomon, later in his life, he starts to, to decline. And then all the preceding kings, most of them at least, just have terrible leadership and are not following God with their heart. And you go from this really high point of Israel and you finish the book of Kings and you see Israel at their lowest point. You have the temple in Jerusalem destroyed and the Babylonian exile is happening and it looks like all hope is over. But as you read through the books of the prophets, this hope yet again is appearing. So we're going to look at the prophets now. We're going to turn to Jeremiah 23 verse 5 and 6. Jeremiah 23 verses 5 through 6. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up David, a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. This commentary says, God will honor his covenant with David. A righteous branch shall reign as king. This Davidic king, a branch from the tree of David, will embody all good kingly characteristics, making good decisions, ruling fairly and correcting, and correctly dispensing justice. The New Testament authors saw that these and other messianic promises were fulfilled in Jesus. So now let's turn to another prophet, Ezekiel. Starting at chapters 37, verses 24 through 25. My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. They shall dwell in the land that I give to my servant Jacob, where your fathers live. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever, and David, my servant, will be their prince forever. And let's flip just a few pages back to Ezekiel 34, verses 23. Another theme of the shepherd. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. I'm going to read the commentary on this one. Ezekiel's announcement of a Davidic shepherd is similar to Jeremiah's. Ezekiel 34 verse 24 affirms the relationship of God and people. Because it is close to verse 15, some commentators wonder whether the shepherd is divine. This passage may look forward to the divine human nature of the Messiah. Such an interpretation would explain John chapter 10, where Jesus says that he is the good shepherd. In doing so, Jesus claims to be both the Davidic Messiah and the incarnate God of Israel. Ezekiel is reluctant to acknowledge any king except God, so he refers to David as prince. 
I'm also gonna go to one more. There are many, many others um, in the prophets, but let's go to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. This is often read around Christmas, actually. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you, as with joy at the harvest as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden, and the staff for his shoulder, for the, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son, is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. There are many others, but I'm going to skip over them. The complexity of this figure starts to grow the more you get into this. Initially, you think this figure, this Davidic figure, is just a king then you realize that there are these other hopes that this person merges with. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 18, we're going to see what Moses said. your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Early on, you see God's people anticipating a prophet like Moses who would speak God's words to them. Not just a prophet. We'll see in another one that there's also this hope for a coming priest. Let's go back to Samuel. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 35 And I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. Then in other passages it becomes clear that this Davidic figure and this priest are actually the same person. Let's go to Psalm 110, verses 1 through 4. The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power, in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. So you see, 
that imagery of mighty scepter in verse 2 and in verse 4 you are a priest forever these two things are describing the same person we can also see this in Jeremiah 33 Jeremiah 33 verses 7 says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, and the Levitical priest shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. So, to recap, this generic hope that we find at the beginning of Genesis starts to crystallize and specify. And you see that this generic offspring of Eve then becomes this royal hope, and this royal hope is then a Davidic hope, and then we see it is a messianic hope. Messiah simply means anointed one. Anointed, anointed one. And interesting, and interestingly we see that there are three offices in Israel were anointed prophet, priest, and king. And there's this expectation that this person will fulfill all of God's promises. And there's five characteristics that you can get from the scriptures about this Davidic king this messianic kingdom. Number one, it's universal reign. This figure will rule over everything in the universe. Number two, it is an everlasting kingdom. We already saw that in 2 Samuel verse, um, chapter 7, verse 16. God's enemies are subdued and destroyed through this Davidic king. Number four, God's people are delivered and protected through his rule. You can see Isaiah 42, verse 3. And number five, the saving knowledge of God is spread to all the nations of the earth. And you can look at Isaiah 49, verse 6. So, then you get fast forward, jumping over a lot of stuff, you get to the New Testament, and you see that Jesus is identified right away as this Davidic king can see in Luke chapter 1 verses 32 through 33 what the angel pro proclaims 32 Luke 1 and 32 this is the angel speaking he will be great and will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. You also see this in Matthew 1 verse 1 where it says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And not only do you see it at the very beginning of the New Testament, you see it at the end as well in Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. Jesus says, I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. So we have all that backstory. And there's more. There's more that could be said, but I'm going to read two more passages that specifically speak to the suffering of this figure, this coming Messiah. I personally find Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 to be my favorite. And Isaiah 53 obviously is the Old Testament, but honestly, if you're not well versed in the Bible, you might think that this is in the New Testament because of how it describes 
Jesus so perfectly. So I'm going to start at verse 2 from Isaiah 53. Actually, verse 1, sorry. All the way to verse 7. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Sure, if he was dead yet, yeah. because what they do is they break the 
their legs for the prisoners to die faster so that they can push themselves up and breathe. So instead of breaking Jesus' legs, they just pierced him with a spear to check if he was dead. And he was because he didn't move. And water and blood came out of his side. And then in verse 18 it says, They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And this was fulfilled. Matthew 27 verse 35. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. <sighs> so that is just full of full of good good stuff. Um and it just brings me to such amazement and awe that Jesus fulfilled all these things. Like, some people think that he did it, he knew the scripture, so he intentionally tried to fulfill all these prophecies, but um, clearly, <laughs> why would you want to go to the cross? You know, why would you want to be the suffering servant and, and die and be pierced for people's transgressions? Um, I don't think just any old regular person would want to do that. And also just the, the probability of somebody fulfilling all of these prophecies is so incredibly low, you have no idea. I'll actually text you the, um, a link to a video I just watched on the probability of somebody fulfilling all these scriptures. But I'm just grateful, grateful that Jesus did to the cross. I'm grateful for his birth, that he came to the earth and humbled himself and stripped away his glory as being God and, and became human flesh. He became a baby. And that's why we celebrate Christmas, because of this birth. Here comes the fulfillment of all these hopes and expectations that have popped up throughout scriptures. And here, here is the one who will set the captives free, who will free us from all of our sins and our shackles to it. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for the cross that we don't have to suffer through that. I think I just want to end with Philippians 2 verses 5 kind of sums up the incarnation. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Praise God. Every learned something or just was a good refresher. That was fun. Oh my gosh, you still have the face mask on. <sighs> wow. I need to get that off of you. Okay. <laughs> Love those sounds.
Pajamas come.
sudden. 